evening, everyone. Welcome to the 2020 Arrow Lecture Series on Ethics and Leadership. My name is Rob Reich. I'm a professor here in the Political Science Department and the faculty director of the Center for Ethics and Society, which is the sponsor of the Arrow Lecture Series. These lectures were created in 2005, and they have become amongst the most prestigious lecture series at Stanford University. Previous Arrow lecturers include a roster of other exceptionally distinguished scientists, social scientists and philosophers, including Paul Collier, Danny Roderick, Thomas Piketty, Tyler Cowen, Jennifer Doudna, Samuel Bowles, and two Nobel Prize winners, Amartya Sen and Esther Duflo. Speaking of Nobel Prize winners, the Arrow Lectures are named in honor of Stanford Emeritus Professor Kenneth Arrow. Arrow was one of the most renowned scholars ever to have taught at Stanford, and one of the most influential economists of the 20th century. He was uh, absolutely essential in creating the Center for Ethics and Society just over 30 years ago. He died in 2017 at the age of 95. Ken was the second youngest recipient ever of the Nobel Prize in Economics. He won at the age of 51. And perhaps even more remarkable than this, I think um, so, five of Professor Arrow's students went on to win the Nobel Prize in Economics. We honor him, Kenneth Arrow, tonight with a presentation from William Crystal. The format for this evening is that Bill Crystal will come up to the stage and give a presentation on the topic about conservatism and responsible conservatism. And then there'll be questions um, from you. Uh, there are microphones on the side of the stage. And then we'll close the evening after a period of questions. Uh, Bill Crystal will be introduced tonight by an amazing Stanford undergraduate named Courtney Cooperman. Courtney is a senior, and she's majoring in political science. And she's writing an honors thesis at the Program on Ethics and Society. Her th thesis, which is nearly complete, examines an urgent social problem through an unfamiliar lens. She explores how a lack of housing prevents people from participating in the democratic process on equal terms with housed citizens, denying the homeless the most fundamental right in a democratic society, namely the right to vote. Courtney has worked as a political speechwriter and served for a summer in the office of her home state senator, Cory Booker, of the great state of New Jersey, also my own home state. And she serves currently as the president of the Stanford Jewish Student Association and writes a column on politics for the Stanford Daily. Her name is one you'll want to remember. You'll soon be hearing her words spoken, I predict, by politicians and soon be reading her words in the opinion columns of newspapers. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Courtney Cooperman. Thank you, Professor Reich, for that kind introduction and just for the role that you've played in my education as a professor and an advisor. Just really grateful to you. The title of tonight's talk, Is a Responsible Conservatism Still Possible? Was it ever? is one of the defining questions of our political moment. Right now is certainly a fascinating time to be an ethics and society student, to take classes that focus on big ideas like justice, democracy, pluralism, and representation, and to spend time working with peers and community members to foster a culture of public service that brings these values into being. There's a heightened sense of urgency around this work. As with every day and every headline, it seems like our most fundamental democratic ideals are under attack. President Donald Trump has been accused of dangerously polarizing our country, distorting the truth, and blurring the line between fringe movements and mainstream conservatism. Many Republicans who were wary of Trump's rise in 2015 and 2016 have become his closest allies. Few have found the moral courage to speak out against him. Tonight's speaker, Dr. William Crystal, is one of those brave and lonely few. Dr. Crystal holds an undergraduate degree and a PhD in government from Harvard University. He taught American politics and political philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania and at Harvard's Kennedy School, then launched a career in government service. He served as chief of staff to Secretary of Education William Bennett in the Reagan administration, and later as chief of staff to Vice President Dan Quayle in the George H.W. Bush administration. In the early 1990s, Dr. Crystal chaired the Project for the Republican Future 
and became a leading Republican political strategist. He launched conservative news magazine, The Weekly Standard, in 1995, and served as its editor-in-chief for over two decades. Dr. Crystal co-founded the Project for the New American Century, a think tank that shaped the foreign policy of the George W. Bush administration, and he currently serves on the Board of Trustees of the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research. He also currently hosts an online podcast, Conversations with Bill Crystal, where he interviews leading public intellectuals and political figures. This resume might make Dr. Crystal an unlikely hero of hashtag the resistance, but in my view, his conservative credentials make his criticism of Donald Trump all the more powerful. Dr. Crystal shows that we can disagree substantively on policy and still cherish the same bedrock principles of American democracy, like pluralism, the rule of law, and respect for institutions. That's why Dr. Crystal is currently putting his efforts into Defending Democracy Together, an advocacy organization standing up for lowercase l liberal democratic norms and principled conservative policies. As the 2020 election approaches and these values face an uncertain future, I can think of no better person to offer his perspective on what conservatism means in our current political moment. With that, it is an honor and a privilege to welcome tonight's distinguished speaker, Dr. William Crystal. Thanks, Courtney, and thanks, Rob. Thank you for that very nice introduction. Uh, Courtney, it's, it's a pleasure to be here at Sanford. It's a really an honor to give the Kenneth Arrow lecture, a somewhat intimidating and humbling, since he was such a great scholar and also such an impressive man. I'm not that easily humbled, but uh, it's not my <laughs> humility is not really my normal style, I would say. But um, in this case, I do feel humble to, to give a lecture named after him, and which he was, I guess, involved in, in, in setting up uh, uh, 15 years ago or so. Um, I also have a personal connection, sort of a slight sentimental connection to Ken Arrow. I knew him very slightly. I was a, in grad school, college and grad school at Harvard in political science when he was an economics professor at Harvard before he inexplicably decided to come out here to Stanford. But anyway, we'll get into that. And um, uh, we were in the same building, economics and political science at the time, so there were at Litauer Hall, so there were some receptions to which, you know, professors and grad students in both departments were invited, and so I met him a few times, and he was always very gracious. I was, of course, intimidated uh, by him. He was so famous, and all the economists looked down on all of us political scientists anyway, since we were not serious, you know, scholars by their light, and, uh, but he concealed, he concealed that part of his, uh, his, maybe that was his view. But anyway, the connection with him that I had, and we discussed this when, I, when we met, is my father, Irvin Crystal, and he were classmates at City College, CCNY, in New York in 1940. Uh, and my father always told the story, and I actually heard this story, and I heard about Ken Arrow before I even knew anything about any of his work, because the story is, I think it's mostly true, maybe not entirely true. Um, well, this part is true. My father went to City College. Uh, he was going to major in math and physics, I think, which I guess most a lot of smart young people, smart young men, I guess they were only men at City College then, uh, were going to major in in the late 30s. If you were you know, a good student, that's what you thought you should do. Um, he took a math course in his first term, uh, and Ken Arrow was in the course. And after about two days, my father decided to switch into history and, <laughs> and pursue a career in journalism and you know, as a man of letters and not compete with Kenneth Arrow and anything that required mathematical knowledge. I think, this, I think this story is true. I mean, they did know each other. They were genuinely classmates and knew each other some in college and sort of stayed in touch over the years. Um, I asked my mother, who, who passed away fairly recently at age 97, um, what, uh, whether she thought it was actually true that my father had you know, seen Arrow or whether it was just generally like so many people, he decided to switch majors and went into something else. And my mother, who was a serious uh, and scholarly historian said she had her doubts about the story, but I, as the editor of a magazine, think it's worth, you know, we used to call stories like that, too good to check, you know? And so, <laughs> it's one of those stories that get printed, if you ever look, notice in the press, this happens with quotations too. It is widely reported that someone said, 
Whenever you see that, it means they actually have not been able to find this quote. But people vaguely think that at some point he or she might have said something. So anyway, a long way of saying that I have the highest regard for, for Ken Arrow and what and his work, obviously, and also what he achieved you know, just as a person. And it's sort of a sentimental uh, thing for me to give a, and my, I told my mom that I was coming out here for this lecture and she was quite moved too. So I, I appreciate that. I am going to take the liberty of uh, not exactly speaking on what I said I was going to speak on. I, this was a few months ago, and I sort of forgot to tell the organizers that I had slightly changed my mind about, you know, it, I, I, this is what think, you have to keep thinking, you know, it's the spirit of Kenneth Arrow, you know, always questioning, don't just stick with the topic you picked three months ago, that would be very boring. And um, so, but I will come back and talk about conservatism or something, but I, honestly, the reason is pretty simple. I mean, these are interesting questions about conservatism, and I've given it quite a lot of thought, and I have a few things to say, I suppose. But I really think, um, I'm now much more convinced than I was even a few months ago, we are facing a crisis of liberal democracy, not just a crisis of conservatism. Conservatism is part of it, obviously. And in a way, it's too narrow a, a, a view, a vision, to just focus on this one particular political movement and its problems and how it produced or, or did it have to produce Donald Trump and all that? Those are interesting questions, but in the real moment we're in, I think uh, I'd like to take a broader look at where we stand politically and where we might, where we might go. And in the spirit of Ken Arrow, I'll, I think I'll raise more questions than I, than I have answers or solutions to offer, but that's the first step, obviously, in trying to think something through. I will give my, my sort of two-sentence version of the history of American conservatism is if you date it back to when Bill Buckley founded National Review in 1955, and let's say it went till 2015, maybe, when Trump announced his candidacy and started to take over the Republican Party, that would be 60 years. It's a pretty good stretch, actually, for a political movement. And I would argue a pretty respectable movement, pretty respectable set of achievements, not right on every issue, some issues wrong, blind spots, darker elements, you might say, of the movement. But on a lot of big issues, especially on sort of basic free market economics, uh, on I think basic foreign policy issues, a pretty responsible movement at times, actually a pretty impressive movement on some things, as I say, uh, didn't really come to grips with, with the changes that were necessary in the country, as you'd expect of a conservative movement. It was resistant to change. But I think a pretty respectable, I think when historians look back, and they say, well, what about this movement? You know, there'll be a fair amount to give it credit for and some demerits. Uh, and then there'll be a lot of debate about how it ended up with or collapsed into or collapsed before the challenge of Trump and Trumpism, which I would consider a kind of national, nationalist populism, sort of demagogic, somewhat authoritarian uh, spirit, which elements of which were always present, obviously. In conservatism, they're probably always present in any big mass movement, um, or some aspects of, of, of those kinds of elements are. But uh, it, they, took, they took over the movement. And the capitulation of the movement to those elements is a very depressing thing for me. Um, maybe that was inevitable, maybe it wasn't. Uh, that's something historians will have to decide. But we are, we are where we are. Uh, and I think where we are is not simply in a crisis of conservatism. Or another way to put it, final word maybe on conservatism and the Republican Party for now, is the, to the degree that there's a crisis of the Republican Party, that's a crisis for America in a way. Because we only have two parties, maybe we'll have more at some point, but we have two big parties. And it's not good for the country if one of those two parties is, in my view, not a responsible, reliable party that is fundamentally committed to sort of certain core democratic norms and institutions, but is willing to tolerate pretty shocking assaults and uh, uh, deviations, you might say, from those democratic and constitutional norms. That's not a situation we've had much in America. We've had elements of both parties that have gone in that direction, but they've always been somewhat marginalized. They've never taken over either party, I would say, really, since World War II. Um, they've never taken over the presidency. And in that respect, the problem we have is an American problem, not just, not just a conservative problem. So I'm not trying to deflect responsibility for it, but simply to make the point that it is a serious, you know, it's not something that liberals honestly should take much pleasure in because it's not good for liberalism not to have a reasonably healthy conservatism. It's not good for America not to have a reasonably healthy liberalism and conservatism, and then maybe a few other things as well. Um, 
Okay, so let me, so where are we? Let me go back to 2016, because I do think that's uh, obviously an important year in American political history, but in a funny way, underappreciated just how big a shock it was and how important a shock it was. We elected in 2016, uh, Donald Trump as president, which again, whatever you think of him, it's very, it, it is unusual just in the sense that Americans have elected every previous American president, uh, either uh, served in elective office or served in the cabinet in a couple of cases and had never been elected to anything, like Herbert Hoover, or had been a general in the US Army. But every single American president had held public office. America's kind of a you know, Wild West, experimental, uh, innovative country, but in its selection of presidents, it's actually been rather cautious and conservative in who's been elevated to that office. For better or worse, and I'm not even making a sort of moral judgment here, just an analytical point, for better or worse, that pattern, which has lasted for all of American history, was broken in 2016. Furthermore, think of the nominating process. I mean, the Republican Party, a party that has been incredibly boring and hierarchical in the way it, it selected nominees, suddenly selected as its nominee in 2016, someone who had no history in the party, had never run, not only run for anything in the party, but been active in the party or in the conservative movement, uh, who had given more money to Democrats than to Republicans, uh, who attacked the most recent Republican presidents, the most recent Republican nominees, a whole host of Republican orthodoxies, ranging from American leadership in the world to free trade to, uh, well, just many, many ones, obviously. Um, disparage John McCain, disparage George W. Bush. Um, again, leaving aside, well, maybe it was good that he did that. Maybe it was necessary to shake things up. Maybe there was, there did turn out to be a market for that kind of anti-establishment, anti-Republican elite rhetoric and to some degree policies. But it's very unusual in American history for either of the major parties to nominate someone who runs against the most recent standard bearers and the most recent doctrines of the party. We've had pretty, you know, we've had people who modified the party. Obama was, wanted to change things a little more than Hillary Clinton in 2008. But we haven't really had a full-on assault on the party establishment and party orthodoxy uh, until, until Trump, and certainly not a successful one. I mean, I guess the closest would be Goldwater way back in 64, but he got clobbered in the general election, and the party assimilated a lot of the Goldwater elements and merged them together with some of the other elements but a very different situation than, than a Trump victory. And Goldwater was a sitting Republican senator and so forth who had been active in Republican politics for a long time, uh, et cetera. Um, on the, now that's the Republican side. On the Democratic side, we, uh, well, we, we, I was gonna say we tend to forget this, we don't forget it now as we're in the Democratic primary season. Something almost equally startling happened, which is Bernie Sanders, and again, I'm not making a normative judgment here. Uh, maybe he's right to challenge the Clintons and all the corporate takeover of the Democratic Party and all the you know, aspects of the party he didn't like. But if you had predicted a few years before that Bernie Sanders, a self-proclaimed Democratic Socialist who wouldn't caucus with the Democrats in the Senate and wouldn't stand as a Democrat in Vermont, stood around as an independent because he regarded the Democratic Party as too as, as having sold out too much to corporate interests and so forth, that Bernie Sanders would get, I think he ended up with what, 43% of the vote against Hillary Clinton in the primaries. People would not have expected that. Trump gets 45% of the vote in the Republican primaries. He wins because it's a split field. Sanders gets 43% of the vote in the Democratic primaries and loses because it's a one-on-one -on -one race. But almost half of the voters, and there was a lot of turnout, big turnout in both parties, almost half of the voters in both parties voted for candidates who, and again, I'm not saying this normatively, but who were, I think it's safe to say, outside the, what had been thought to be the mainstream of either party, who attacked the most recent successful, criticized the most recent successful presidents of that party, who had always been dissidents within the party, in Sanders' case, or in Trump's case, uh, you know, just not, not active in the party. I think neither of them had ever spoken at a party convention until 2016, this is another way of putting it. So that's unusual. American politics for the last 70 years or so has been pretty conventional. The Republicans more so, almost ridiculously so, they always nominate the next in line. You know, Ford beats Reagan in 76, so Reagan gets the nomination in 80. Reagan beats Bush, so Bush gets the nomination in 88. Bush beats Dole, so Dole gets the nomination in 96. Uh, then they go crazy and nominate George W. Bush in 
2000, the son of a former president. That's like for Republicans, that was really exciting, you know? It's a real, really bold, radical move. Um, uh, Bush beats McCain. McCain wins in 2008. I remember giving a speech in 2011, and I was recounting this, and saying, you know, this is such a ridiculous pattern. I mean, is it really intelligent for a political party just to nominate the second place finisher from last time? It's probably not the best way to pick your candidates, and some of those people were not actually good general election candidates, Bob Dole and stuff. And I remember saying, and so because it's kind of ridiculous, I assume it'll come to an end, and I assume Mitt Romney won't be the nominee in 2012, even though he was the runner-up to John McCain in 2008, and sure enough, the Republicans cheerfully went ahead and nominated Mitt Romney in 2012. Uh, that, but I was right, in a way, four years ahead of time in the sense of sensing that this couldn't go on forever. But I did not expect it to break as radically as it did in 2016. And even on the Democratic side, the Democrats are a little more daring. They'll nominate a young governor like Bill Clinton or a young senator like Barack Obama. But if you look at the Democratic nominees from 1980 on, it's pretty – they're former vice, pre the vice presidents, they're governors who have some standing in the party, Dukakis, Clinton, senators who've been around a long time, John Kerry, Obama upset Clinton. That was a sort of a big deal. But he had the support of a lot of Democratic heavyweights and was an unusually talented, obviously, politician. Uh, so again, no huge surprises, I would say. Nothing that would have predicted the degree of unhappiness with the way the party was going that Sanders was able to tap into. Another way to look at this, I'll just one more point on this, is if you look at American politics with the administrations from 1980 on, what do we have? Reagan and Bush for 12 years, basically. Uh, Clinton administration for eight years, Bush for eight years, Obama for eight years. Three eight-year presidencies following a 12-year stretch, really. We hadn't had three eight-year presidencies since the first part of the beginning of the 19th century. I mean, it's the most stable, in a way, predictable, uh, least turmoil in American politics in a long, long time. Now, it didn't feel that way when you're in the middle of it. Clinton's getting impeached, and there's 9-11, and there's the Iraq War, and there's the 2008 crisis. But if you, at the party level, at the political leadership level, it was very stable and almost boringly predictable, you might say. And you could have predicted ahead of time half the cabinet positions of each president, and they saw, you know, George Bush selected uh, Dick, you know, Dick Cheney as his VP, and I mean, it just, it was very much, Obama kept, uh, took back the financial team, you know, kept some of Bush's financial people and brought in, you know, very sort of uh, establishment, you might say, financial types in the middle of the financial crisis, and kept the, Bob Gates as defense secretary and Leon Panetta. I mean, it was, it was the establishments of both parties seemed to be riding high, and they both crashed in 2016, the slight difference that Hillary Clinton did win the nomination, but then she lost the election. And Bernie Sanders is now probably the front runner, marginally, I would say, the front runner for the Democratic nomination in 2020. So it's not as if that's just gone away. And let's look at 2020, uh, now moving ahead from 2016. Trump has intensified his hold, solidified his hold on the Republican Party in a very big way. People like me who hoped there'd be rebellions at different points or separation or at least some flicker of a flame uh, for no, of non-Trump Republicanism have been sorely disappointed. Uh, the conservative movement, conservative intellectuals mostly have accommodated to or rationalized or even embraced Trump and Trumpism. Uh, so it would, it's, there's not much evidence that Trump's takeover hasn't been entirely successful. And even going forward, if he loses in 2020, it's an interesting question what happens. I mean, do we think in 20, let's assume he loses a, you know, by a few points in 2020, and let's assume, let's hope we have a free and fair election and we don't have riots and Trump doesn't challenge the results and try to cause a constitutional crisis and we actually have a turnover of power. Even so, he's not going away. His kids, his family's not going away. His supporters aren't going away, and nor should they. It's a free country. They're entitled to continue to advance their point of view. Will it help or hurt Republican candidates for Congress, for the Senate, for the House in 2022 to be Trump supporters or Trump critics? I would like the answer to be Trump critics, since I'm a Trump critic, but I can't confidently say that. So I do think we've had a huge disruption, and people who thought, well, it's just going to be a temporary disruption, disruption doesn't look that way on the right, certainly, on the Republican side. Democratic side's much you know, harder to tell, obviously. A lot depends whether Sanders is the nominee, or Buttigieg, or, or uh, Klobuchar, or Bloomberg. That would be interesting, and God knows how that would play out then at the convention, and what would happen. Um, 
But insofar as the younger part of the party is with Sanders, it's, again, it's a little hard to see a reversion to a kind of John Kerry, Hillary Clinton, Democratic Party as well. I think things are much more up in the air on the liberal side, on the Democratic side. So in both cases, you had a big break in 2016. And it looks like that break wasn't temporary, at least for now. Certainly on the right, maybe on the left. So that's a big deal. You know, that doesn't happen that often in American politics. As I say, if you write the history from 1980 to 2016, you have a history basically of continuity, for better or worse. And again, people can say there was too much continuity, all kinds of issues were papered over, the elites lost touch with the public, the establishments were irresponsible and didn't pay a price for their mistakes in Iraq in 2008, that's all fine. But just analytically, it was, there were, the rebellions against them did not succeed. The Pat Buchanan's of the world did not win the Republican nomination or the Ron Paul's of the world. The, I don't know quite on the Democratic side who the equivalent would even be, but Jesse Jackson, I suppose, maybe, or even like John Edwards. Those people did not you know, fundamentally challenge the Democratic establishment. Barack Obama did sort of, but then governed, I think it's fair to say, as a pretty traditional uh, liberal, liberal Democrat. So that has now, I think we are in a new era. I think that's the first piece of wisdom really to have, that one should have about American politics. And thinking that it's gonna go back to the way it was, that I think is unlikely. It's not usually the way the world works. We could end up in a very different place. Doesn't mean we're gonna end up with you know, Trumpism and the Republican side and Sandersism on the Democratic side forever or even for the next five years. But it does mean that whatever happens, it's not gonna look exactly the way it looked in 2015. And it was unanticipated. Final point about this. People did not sit around in early 2015 thinking Donald Trump's gonna be the Republican nominee and Bernie Sanders is gonna be the main challenger to Hillary Clinton. And it, you, know, you can say people are out of touch and they should have known that, but I don't know. I'm not sure they really should have or even could have known that. It really kind of came out of nowhere. One striking thing is if you told a historian or a social scientist there's gonna be challenges in both parties in the same year to the elites, to the establishments, and they're gonna succeed in one case and you know, come pretty close to succeeding in the other case with Sanders. What do you think would be happening in the country then? I think any social scientist would say, I don't know, depression, uh, horrible economic challenges, uh, a war going very badly, a Vietnam type situation, which led to Gene McCarthy and, and then to George McGovern. We didn't have that in 2015, 2016. Now we had had Iraq, we had had the 08 crisis, maybe it was a delayed reaction, you can have fancy arguments to that effect, but it's still pretty startling to me that in a country that was not, you know, visibly in a morass like Vietnam with 55,000 people, young Americans dying, that was not visibly in a Great Depression type situation in the world, in a world that was not obviously blowing up. People like me were critical of Obama's foreign policy, whatever, but it wasn't, you know, things weren't, that we did not have, it was not the 30s, right? Uh, you still had this degree of discontent that, I think, is very revealing and has to be taken seriously. Now, the one question, of course, is, uh, and I've touched on it already a little bit, I mean, how transient uh, a phenomenon could this be? There, it does have its flukish aspects. It didn't have to happen. Trump didn't have to win the nomination. Jeb Bush turned out to be a particularly bad establishment candidate. Hillary Clinton turned out, I think, to be a pretty weak general election candidate. It is kind of comical that in a year when there was clearly a mood for change, if not for radical reform necessarily. There's a mood for change. The two party establishments said, you want change? We have a great idea. Let's have a Bush-Clinton race. <laughs> we had one in 92, that was fun, so we'll just have another one. And on the, Democrat, on the Republican side, you, know, you already elected the pre President George H.W. Bush and you elected his son, so now you get a chance to elect his other son. You know? And the brother, and the brother of the most recent Republican president, and on the Democratic side, you get to elect the spouse of the next to most recent Democratic president, who also served as Secretary of State for the current Democratic president. You want change? We're giving you Bush and Clinton. I do think that was actually a key part of Trump's success, and probably Sanders as well. The sense that the establishments were just giving, were not being responsive at all, and therefore Trump was able to uh, very effectively uh, campaign against Jeb Bush. The other candidates ended up hurting each other. There were a lot of weird things that happened. It didn't have to be the case that Trump uh, won. It would be an interesting thought experiment. What if Trump hadn't come down the escalator at Trump Tower 
in 2015? What if he had just decided not to run? He had decided not to run a few couple of times before, right? How does that play out? We probably end up with some Scott Walker or Marco Rubio or something, you know, nominee, I guess, a kind of boring race against Hillary Clinton. Maybe one of, one of them wins, and maybe we're, have, we're discussing here how boring American politics is, and, you know, and everyone on the left and the right is unhappy because we have such centrist domination of American politics, and everyone's too respectful of our institutions and too committed to our traditional alliances and so forth. But it's, so there is something fluky about it. And of course, winning the presidency really was flukish. I mean, drawing the inside straight in the Electoral College, uh, winning with that two and a half million vote deficiency in the popular vote, uh, getting the Republic, the, the help of the Russians, that didn't, that didn't hurt probably, getting Comey's intervention, which I think clearly did elect Trump. I mean, it wasn't his intention, uh, but there's no question if you look at the polls that, that gave Trump, knocked Clinton down a point or two at the end uh, when he revived, apparently on a very foolish grounds really, the whole investigation into the, uh, the FBI investigation into the emails and the server. So none of those things had to happen, but they did happen. And now we're in a situation where Trump has been president for three years. So one can go back and say it didn't have to be this way, but it now has a certain reality that has its own effects. I remember discussing this once at the Weekly Standard, and we were going about all the kind of flukish thing, including even much more technical almost things that happened in the Republican race that could have derailed Trump, and then all the things Clinton might have done that would have caused her to win. Um, and uh, it's just kind of an accident that we are where we are. And my colleague, young colleague, John McCormick said, you know, it was sort of an accident that we stumbled into World War I, right? I mean, there were one thing led to another in a very kind of unpredictable and somewhat and whack kind of odd way uh, from about 1911 to 1914. But once you get into World War I, the world changes, right? And the fact that it didn't have to happen, and if you had had slightly more responsible behavior by the Kaiser, or if the assassin had missed his shot in Sarajevo, or if the Austrians hadn't declared, I don't even remember the history particularly, but you know, if one country hadn't declared one another, and if there hadn't been the alliance structure which triggered reciprocal declarations of war, uh, maybe we, the whole history of the world would have been different. But it happened. Once you're in the war, you're in the war, and that has its own you know, its own implications, its own, its own uh, rationale, so to speak. And that's, I think, the situation we're in. So even if it's somewhat arbitrary that we, we've gotten to where we are, even if it's slightly inexplicable as to why voters were as discontented with the establishments as they were, um, we now have a situation where we have Donald Trump as president. Again, I don't mean to particularly demonize Trump. I'm, I'm happy to do it a little bit, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm not, not for the purposes of this talk, but simply to say that it's having real effects, obviously, certainly on the Republican Party, certainly on the actual executive branch of the federal government, certainly on Congress, certainly on the courts, and certainly on our public life. You know, it would be foolish to minimize, I think, those effects. So that's why I come back to 2016 being a pretty big division point. It's worth taking a second on sort of what might have been underlying the discontent, the anxiety, the unhappiness that led to both the Trump and Sanders surges and that people like me, I'm sure, missed to a large degree. I guess I have the kind of conventional view that in retrospect, globalization, well, let's go back to the social scientists coming down from Mars and taking a look at, <coughs> excuse me, taking a look at America. On the one hand, he or she would be surprised, I think, that there's no depression, no war. Why is there so much turmoil, so much unhappiness, so much discontent, so much rebelliousness? On the other hand, if you told the social scientist or economist or historian, well, we're going to have 20 years of globalization. We're going to basically, the world trading system is going to well, you know, admit China and India, and those countries are going to boom, and there'll be a huge amount, and they'll have a billion new people in the labor market, basically. That will put huge downward pressure on some wages in the US. It will also lead to a lot of economic growth and prosperity, especially in those countries, but all around the world, really. But that's quite a lot of, you know, that's a big change. Globalization was a big deal. And if you look at history, when you have a change of that magnitude, it often has disruptive effects, as you'd expect, on the domestic politics of a country. If you add in, then, the technological revolution, which is, uh, yeah, I don't know, coming here to Silicon Valley, it's not, I don't need to go into this in any de detail. But I will say, when, I, when, it, when it early, in early days of the internet and uh, 
uh, email and you know all this. I actually thought this is not going. I mean, it's, of course, it's interesting and it's um, useful and it challenges magazines because now we can't just have a print magazine. We have to have a website and all this. But it didn't seem to me to be fundamentally changing things. Searching for things on Google is much easier than doing a Google search than going to a library to look at an encyclopedia. But you know, in principle, it's kind of research. You know. And putting out a website, uh, producing a website is different from putting out a magazine, but it's not that different. Um, and email is great, but it's not, it's faster than regular mail, and it's easier than making a phone call. But again, it's, you know, does it really change social relationships that much? I do think I underestimated that, though, especially when you got the iPhone, when you get the instant, instant availability of all information to all individuals in the world and instant connectivity of all individuals to each other all over the world. That's a pretty astonishing thing by historical standards. And it has had huge disruptive, it's having huge disruptive effects. That I think, unlike globalization, where I think we've seen most of the disruption, I think with automation we're just seeing, we're probably in the early stages of the disruption that's going to have to people's jobs, but also people's communities, people's lives, higher education, which has been actually amazingly resistant to much change, maybe for better or worse, maybe for better, but uh, you've got to think it's not. Stanford now looks more like Stanford 50 years ago than one might have expected 50 years ago, but I don't think in 50 years it's going to, education will look the same as it does today, and, and I think an awful lot of things will look very, very different. So that's a big disruption. Those two together have had a real effect. My colleague Bill Galston, who's a moderate Democrat, certainly the Bill Clinton White House, uh, looked at these some polling pretty carefully about a year ago. It was interesting. In 08, there was a huge crisis. People lost their jobs. Their houses went down 20% in value. It was really scary you know, at the time. But people actually had a fair amount of faith that the system would work. And the system did kind of work. I mean, we came back pretty quickly. It was a slow recovery, but people, you know, houses mostly, almost entirely, actually recovered their value. And people got back into, got employed again. They didn't quite have the jobs they might have had before, and they might have had taken a hit on salary and so forth, but uh, you might say the economy recovered both nationally uh, and globally. So what Bill noticed in the polling it was interesting. People had more confidence in 2009 that, that we would recover and that the future would be brighter than they did in 2013. And around 2013, they sort of looked up in sort of middle America, if I can overgeneralize widely, and saw, geez, we're in it, we're having a recovery. Things aren't going terribly, you know. We're not, it's not obvious they're gonna go much better. And yet, I'm never really gonna quite have the job I had 10 years ago. I'm never gonna get quite back to that level of income before the steel company left my city or before the, you know, something else uh, changed in the local economy. And my kids, who maybe are not at Stanford, but are, you know, went to one year of community college and then didn't like it and, and dropped out and took various jobs are not going to have as easy a time getting to a kind of you know, upper working class, middle class lifestyle that one certainly could get to in America without a college education, without a, without a prestigious college education. And that, I mean, Bill's analysis of the polls was that that sort of started to sink in to people, that we really had, there'd been a change and that their own lives were looking a little grimmer than they would have hoped, but more importantly, really, that they couldn't count on their kids doing better than they. And in fact, this is true if you look at the Gallup and Pew polls. For the first time, really in modern American history, in around 2013, people started to lose, a majority of Americans, or at least the plurality, started to lose confidence that their children's lives would be better than theirs. And that is a kind of indicator, obviously, of a social uh, unrest and a possibility of uh, having rebellious, you know, voters rebelling against the, the economic establishment, the political establishment, the cultural establishment, and so forth. And then if you add to those two economic factors, globalization and, and um, you know, automation, I guess you'd say, technology, a pretty big cultural transformation in the country. A cultural transformation, I would say, that was mostly for the better. But if you add together immigration, which was pretty high, has been pretty high for the last 20, 30 years, and has been changing the look of the country, um, and the changes in cultural and social mores, obviously, um, the status of women, sexual uh, orientation, and so forth. Um, it's a lot of changes to happen pretty quickly. I myself am okay, or uh, even 
even if I wasn't okay at first, I am now okay with most with all almost all those changes, and I actually think they've been probably been a good thing. I think the reaction against them has been wildly overstated in some ways, but just as an actual matter of human psychology, you know, people do get a little startled and a little unnerved, and they grew up in a country that had a certain set of patterns for 40 years, and their parents had it, and suddenly everything's changing, and what have, what does this imply for them? And who t they didn't get a vote. No one asked them, you know, and suddenly these things are just happening around them. I think, and it, it, there's a sense of powerlessness. And if you get demagogues who don't say, hey, look, there are some pluses and minuses here, but the pluses outweigh the minuses. And anyway, you're not going to roll it back. And let's figure out how you can have some of the things you care about while accommodating and accepting a lot of these social and cultural changes. If you get demagogues who demonize the people who are carrying the change or the visible embodiments of the change or immigrants, it's why immigration was such a big issue, I think in 2015, 2016. It was a puzzle to a lot of political analysts. Immigration was a huge issue in parts of the country that have very few immigrants and where they're not taking jobs from anyone. And why are people going around yelling about immigration? Well, they've seen it on TV. But more important, really, it's, it's the sense that the whole country is sort of changing under their feet and they didn't get a, a chance to vote. And then they believe whatever they see on TV about how no one is speaking English in a certain city and crime rates are, you know, are booming in immigrant communities and uh, you know, terrorists are coming across the border and God knows what and suddenly you've got a sort of semi-frenzy about a particular, about that issue. But it is interesting, if you look at the polling in the US and in much of Europe, immigration was the one issue that seems to really galvanize on the Trump side of things, uh, the, the unhappiness. That's the inequality was kind of the, equal issue on the left. Um, there are legitimate questions about inequality, and it's certainly gone up in the last 30 years. Whether it's as much of a problem or a boogeyman, or let's put it this way, if you solved inequality tomorrow, would it really change? I mean, just had 75% tax rates and wealth taxes and really reduce the Gini coefficient and all these things and had a more equal dif uh, distribution of wealth, would it really change the life prospects of someone in a town in Ohio who is 48 years old and was trained to do a job that doesn't exist anymore and whose kids don't have a college education. Actually, it wouldn't change it that much, I don't think. So there's a little bit of a, I think, a mismatch there between the analysis and the remedy. But I'd say immigration on the right, inequality on the left, both became the thing you could complain about and blame for whatever you didn't like about America today. And it turned out people didn't like more about America today uh, than, than people like me, I guess, uh, realized. Or they didn't like it, they'd always sort of not liked certain things, but in a way they hadn't been allowed to express their dislikes because the politicians, for better or worse, I would say for better, many people, some people might say for worse, had actually not appealed to those, unhappy, those resentments and anxieties very much. And if anything, had tried to damp them down a little bit. President Obama, I think, would be an instance of this. Um, and Romney on the other side, really. And so, you know, but when you have politicians who are willing to say on the left, the whole system is rigged, you know, it's just, it's a kind of conspiracy in Wall Street to just, you know, deprive working people of their uh, just gains and, you know, enrich the bankers. And when on the left and the right, I think more perniciously even, you get the kind of Trumpy rhetoric. Once people hear that, they think, oh, okay, I've kind of always suspected that but now I have someone saying it for me. And so they flocked to those champions, which were Trump and Sanders, but I think many people beyond Trump and Sanders, obviously, at this point. Just one note on the cultural side, I mean, uh, my friend Ron Brownstein, a very fine journalist out, to, uh, uh, was with the LA Times for a long time, and now National Journal, The Atlantic, and CNN, I guess now, uh, writes, has this formulation on the two parties, uh, that we have a party of transformation, the Democratic Party, a party that accepts and even applauds the transformation of our society and culture, uh, and a party of restoration, a party that wants to restore us to the way things were at some mythical time or other, but whatever, the 50s or the 60s. I mean, it is very revealing, I think, that Trump's uh, uh, slogan was make America great again, 
which is funny in America, which is such a forward-looking country, you know, usually, isn't it such a cliche? Our best days are still ahead of us. Every politician from both parties has said that in every speech they've given, so for, you know, in my adult lifetime, and suddenly you have a president say, Reagan used it a little bit, actually, but Ra the Make America Great Again against Carter, but that was much more a specific, Carter has done a bad job and we can get back up, but Reagan's general rhetoric was very much different, obviously, you know, city on a hill, aspirational, future, we have a bright future ahead of us. Uh, that dark Trump rhetoric about the present, American carnage, and the yearning for some past is, I think, very revealing of a, what Ron calls a party of restoration. When you have a party of restoration and a party of transformation, it's a little harder to have the normal compromises across parties. You have two parties that have, to some degree, really different visions of America. One who sees a future that's diverse and multi-ethnic and same-sex marriage and high-tech and this and that, and another that sees you know, a, a certain kind of nostalgic America, perhaps, of the 50s and 60s. A little hard to, those, there's a certain tendency when you have two parties that are governed or that are inclined that way. It reinforces what already was there, which was the polarization and hyperpolarization of the parties and of our politics, which had its own causes, somewhat separate, I think, from the Trump-Sanders thing, but it all fed together to create a situation of uh, a sense that the country was out of control, the establishments were failing, the other party was not a party that you could responsibly deal with, that it was, as the rhetoric went, uh, the Flight 93 election. It was an election where if we lost this, we'd never have a chance again. That was very strong on the right this year. It's stronger, I'd say, on the left. Um, and so we have a situation that's very different from American politics, from, as I say, from 1980 to 2016, really. And it happened quite suddenly. And it didn't happen with, you know, the storming of the Bastille and the execution of the king or some, you know, dramatic events in a funny way. It happened with one election campaign in a fairly placid time economically and in terms of foreign policy, uh, and then the after effects of that election campaign. As I say, I think historians will write very interesting books and articles about what would have happened, you know, what if Hillary Clinton, 77,000 votes had gone differently in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, and Hillary Clinton were president. I really don't know. I mean, would think, would we still, would that just have been like a Band-Aid and eventually we would have ended up with the kinds of politics we now seem to have, Trumpism on the right and dissatisfaction on the left, or would it really have changed things? And I, I really don't know, actually. I, I, I think history is pretty contingent, so I don't like the argument that, you know, these things were inevitable, but there clearly were things brewing that exploded in 2016 and continued progress. For me, that's part of the story. I mean, if Trump and Trump is, and let me just address the conservative side of it, if it were temporary, we would see it. We would see a lot of young Republican politicians sort of distancing themselves from Trump. We would see a lot of conservative intellectuals saying, well, that can't be the future. We need to rethink some things, but we can't go down that path. We're not seeing much of that at all. Could we see more of that after Trump loses? Sure. Being Winning is a very a big deterrent to, a big inducement to get on the team, to get on board. But the degree of it I find unnerving. The well, less more complicated, I will say, and I think there, there's much more of a real debate and much more uncertainty about where that, where they go. Um, what's gonna happen? I don't know, obviously. Uh, political prognostication was always uh, risky and, and over, oversold, but of course after 2016, we all should have been, we were all were thoroughly discredited. I will say in my defense, I, the thing that surprised me was, as you would, from this talk, consistent with this talk, I really assumed the Republican Party would have, do what it always did, which was have a Donald Trump run, just the way Pat Buchanan ran, just the way Ron Paul ran, just the way Herman Cain, and there was always a Steve Forbes who were different from Trump, but still, there were always these business candidates who challenged the politicians. And they often did well for a while, and sometimes they led the polls or won one state, and then, you know, the party kind of pulled itself together and nominated the Bob Doles and the George Bushes and the Mitt Romneys, and I assumed that's what would happen, so I was totally wrong about the primary. I just didn't see that coming at all. And again, I don't think I was crazy. I mean, the Republicans had won the House in 2010 with running pretty conventional politicians, a little Tea Party stuff, but that got absorbed into the party. 2014 Republican candidates, if you looked around the country, the people who won those Senate races, totally normal, basically, Republican politicians. There wasn't a lot of talk about, let's have protectionism, let's abandon our traditional allies. 
abroad. Let's demonize immigrants. The, the immigration issue was harder, but even there, the establishment of the party was inclined towards trying to work something out and damp down the frictions and so forth. Um, anyway, it, it certainly didn't, it didn't go that way. Um, the, party, the party went the way, the way it went. Um, what will happen? Anyway, so I, I, I got the Republican primary wrong. I will say that I did see in the general election that Trump had a chance. I mean, I just, I'd been through a 92 election where George H.W. Bush lost, and I was part of that White House. The country was not in terrible shape in 92. We had won the Cold War, you know, without firing a shot. We had a minor recession in 91, which we were coming out of. Uh, the country was, you know, in a pretty good decade, I would argue. Uh, none of us expected Pat Buchanan to suddenly get 37% of the vote in New Hampshire. Uh, none of us expected a young governor of Arkansas to suddenly emerge and for a lot of voters to decide that had enough of Reagan and Bush, it was time for a generational change. But that, in retrospect, was pretty easy to explain. We won the Cold War. The voters thought Reagan and Bush had done a good job. They were foreign policy presidents, especially George H.W. Bush really was. I remember a meeting in the White House in 92 with President Bush, and he couldn't really believe he was losing, actually, because in his generation, if you were a good national security president, which he was, you got reelected. That was the task of the president. Education, health care, that was Congress, that was the states mostly. It's complicated. People would work that out. You should give some general guidance. The idea that you would, they would replace him after pretty masterful management of the end of the Cold War, something we now just take for credit, but of course it didn't have to go that well, right? And then kicking Saddam out of Kuwait and so forth. Um, he just sort of assumed that that was the same electorate that had elected Reagan twice and elected him once. And it was literally the same electorate, except for the four years of turnover. But it was, it was a good lesson for me in how fast things can change. And a good lesson for me that if people want change, they want change. I mean, I spent 92 giving speeches about, hey, things are pretty good, you know? Reagan was a good president, Bush was a good president. Do you really want this untested governor from Arkansas? You know, Democrats already control Congress. They have enough power. And people said, that's very nice. And they went, promptly went out. And, Think about this, George H.W. Bush, who was a pretty successful president, historians, I think, would say, got 54% of the vote in 1988. He got 38% of the vote in 1992. 16% drop. One in, what's my math here? One in four, more than one in four, yeah. Bush voters deserted him from 88 to 92. And it wasn't Hoover, you know? It wasn't in the middle of the Depression, right? We hadn't had any horrible failures in foreign policy or in domestic policy. In fact, he signed some good legislation in a bipartisan way, Americans with Disabilities Act, the Clean Air Act, and stuff. It's a good lesson for me that voters can be irrational, it's too strong, but uh, they can get in a mood. And in that case, the mood was for change. And Clinton tapped into it, and Ross Perot tapped into it. 19 million Americans voted for you know, a crazy person from Texas to be <laughs> president. I used to tell this jokingly and say that's a lesson. It was a wake-up call for me. You know, I'm sort of you know, a political scientist. You assume voters are kind of rational. You assume that the facts matter a lot. And Ross Perot, I mean, he had one issue, the deficit, which was legitimate. But I mean, he wasn't, I don't think, really would want him as president. But uh, that was, in a way, a bit of a precursor to Trump, really, honestly, uh, 20, what, 28, 16, 24 years later. But of course, that then faded away. That was the funny thing, right? Buchanan faded away. Perot faded away. It went right back to normalcy. Bush, you know, Obama, et cetera. Um, and it all sort of came back on steroids, you might say, in, in 2016. Um, so that's why I did think in the general election that Trump had a chance. When the mood is for change, people will take a risk on change. And Trump was going to change things. Trump had a clear agenda. He was going to build a wall. He was going to cut out, get, stop all these immigrants from flooding in. He was going to stop fighting wars that our allies should take care of themselves. Uh, they should take care of their own problems. He should he was going to protect us from very bad foreign uh, trade deals. And no one could describe Hillary Clinton's agenda as simply as Trump could describe his. And as one Hillary Clinton Aid put it to me, you know, bad solutions be no solutions. And it's unfair to say that she had no solutions, but it looked that way, I think, to voters. And Trump's simple solutions and non-solutions, really, uh, ended up narrowly prevailing. And anyway, I remember during the campaign saying, I thought there was a chance Trump would win. People said, oh, no, he couldn't do it. And I just said, I don't know. I've been through this a little. And if people want change, they want change. And maybe that's what happened a little bit in 2015, 2016. It's not clear to me that the objective correlatives were there, but People, countries do go through these periods, and 
uh, the grievances accumulate and they, uh, and they get changed. Um, I will tell one last story. And then I went to a Trump rally. So, so when was the Virginia primary? It was well, March, just like it is this year. So this would have been February, I suppose, of 2016. And I wanted to see it sort of for myself. So it was right near, pretty close to where I live in, in Northern Virginia. So I went there and you know, various people recognized me at the Trump rally and they weren't all thrilled to see me since I was already kind of an anti-Trump Republican, but they kind of vaguely you know, liked me from uh, I don't know, the old days when I was on Fox News Sunday or something. So I remember having a nice conversation with an intelligent woman. At, this is Northern Virginia, pretty upscale kind of communities, you know. Uh, a woman who was for Trump and she couldn't understand why I was so worried about Trump and so hostile. And I said, I just don't think his policies are good. I don't think his character is right for being president. Well, we need change. We just need to, we need to shake things up. And I remember saying, well, I'm actually, myself, for most of my career in Washington, have been on the reformist side of things, on the shake things up side of things. You know, I was a Kemp Republican. I was a McCain Republican. I wasn't really a, that much of a defender of the status quo. But I do think you have to be serious and responsible about the kind of change you want to have and make sure it ends up better, you know? And she was, oh, that's just the establishment talking. And we, it, it, we need to really just blow things up. And I said, really? I mean, you know, yeah, is it that bad? And she said, it can't get worse. And I thought, <laughs> America, 2016, Northern Virginia, which is actually quite a prosperous area, you know, and people are doing pretty well. It can get a lot worse, really, you know. <laughs> and it has been a lot worse for a lot of our history. And, but once that mood gets out there, it's not fair to make fun of people either. I mean, they have their own issues and their grievances and so forth, and you don't know their personal situations, but um, once that mood gets out there, it can be strong. Uh, I've, worried, I've thought a lot about this. Is, it, is the fact that, there, that we weren't in a recession, that we weren't in a Vietnam War type situation, that there weren't riots in the streets really, uh, is the fact that objectively the situation, you might say, wasn't that bad, but there was so much discontent is that heartening in the sense that it suggests that maybe the discontent kind of just fades away? That would be like 92, 93, I would say. The Perot voters get absorbed, the Buchanan voters kind of just fade away, and the country returns to normalcy. Or is it more worrisome that without that many objective causes, I would say, there's this much discontent? What if there is a recession? What if there, what if there is a, we stumble into a war, it could happen, not because of Trump even, just because of the way the world is, right? Or there's a difficult foreign policy challenge, or you know, Xi decides to divert people from his mismanagement of the health crisis to by you know, and lobbing some missiles at Taiwan, and we get into some exchange. I mean, these things can happen. And what do people do then? I mean, so I don't know whether it's a good thing, whether, it's a, whether we should be encouraged or discouraged that based on relatively, in my view, not so serious, you know, uh, challenges or, 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 or setbacks. We've had such a high level of discontent. In any case, what could happen? We could muddle through, obviously. That's usually what happens in history. America's muddled through crises before. We muddled through the late 19th century, early 20th century. Massive change from agriculture to industrial, industrialization. We had the progressives. We had William Jennings Bryan uh, trying to bring us back to a older America, we had progressives in both parties, Teddy Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, and eventually Roosevelt and the New Deal, and you kind of made it through this historical epoch with the institutions of American government changed to some degree, but recognizable and I think stronger perhaps at the end than at the beginning. Britain, I would say you could find a comparable story in the early 19th century during their industrial revolution, where you know in the middle of it, it looked very dicey and there are riots, there are politicians getting assassinated, there are you know, talk about revolution on the left and revolution on the right, and there are such revolutions going on in other countries, but healthy political systems kind of take the blows and, and make it through and with some adjustments obviously to the, to the institutions. I would say if you want to look more recently for a model, think about America from 1960, let's say, to 1980. So I said before that from 1980 to 2016, I think we have a period of relative stability. But look at 1960 to 1980. 1960, totally boring conventional election between a, what was regarded as a centrist Republican, uh, Richard Nixon, a centrist Democrat, John Kennedy, close election, very few issues really at stake. Kennedy wins, nothing much happens. James McGregor Burns, a very distinguished political scientist, writes a book in 1962, Deadlock of Democracy. 
things are very bad in America, nothing can get done. You know, Congress can't pass any legislation. The American Political Science Association is very worried that the two parties are so um, centrist and mixed up and there are all these Southern Democrats along with Northern labor and Northern civil rights activists and the Republicans have all these Northeastern Republicans as well as you know, much more libertarian and conservative Republicans from the West and you don't have party accountability, and it's all just a total centrist muddle, very dissatisfying if you're a political scientist who wants clarity. Then we promptly have everything, you know, a huge wave of legislation, obviously, in the 60s, the parties reorganize themselves, good example of how political scientists often get things totally wrong. Um, but, but think of the 60 to 80, so 60 election, Kennedy gets assassinated, Republican Party goes right and Goldwater wins the nomination in 64. A huge upset. First successful challenge to the Eastern Republican establishment in 30 years. Gets clobbered by Johnson. Everyone decides, well, that's finished. But in fact, Ronald Reagan, and it's really not even that well-known actor, a B-level actor, who gave, made his entrance into the national scene by giving a, a national speech on television in October, a very effective speech for Goldwater, who, however, is still lost by 22 points, you know. Reagan runs for governor of California in 66, defeats the moderate establishment, uh, mayor of San Francisco, actually, that's kind of funny that San Francisco had a Republican mayor in 1966, uh, in the Republican primary. It was an upset, and then clobbers the, the popular Democratic governor, Pat Brown, in 66, governor for two years, uh, two terms, ends up as president in 1980. I mean, so that shows how, how much happened in those 20 years. Reagan speaks for Goldwater, Goldwater clobbered, Reagan wins the presidency 16 years later. Democratic side, Vietnam, uh, Wallace, the Southern Democrats split off, McGovern Rebellion, the, the left takes over the Democratic Party, sort of, uh, insurrection against the establishment. Uh, McGovern gets clobbered by Nixon, Nixon gets, is gonna get impeached and resigns. Uh, in 76, Jimmy Carter comes out of nowhere to win the Democratic nomination. Ronald Reagan challenges Ford, the incumbent president, almost beats him in 76. In 80, uh, Kennedy challenges the incumbent Democratic president, Jimmy Carter, and almost beats him. Uh, Reagan gets renominated and wins an election in which he loses, actually, a liberal Republican, John Anderson, splits off and wins as a centrist. I mean, the story of American politics and the story of American society, if you think about those years, Vietnam, the civil rights revolution, the beginnings of feminism, the beginnings of environmentalism. I mean, those 16 years from 64 to 80 are years of turmoil, unhappiness, rebellion, establishment figures getting, falling on both sides. I think you could argue we came out of it stronger than we went into it, and some of the change, a lot of the changes were necessary and healthy. But if you were in the middle of it, and I was just old enough to kind of remember the sentiment, you know, and I went to Harvard in 1970, it was pretty crazy and pretty unnerving to a lot of people. So that's an example. I do think our politics will be more like the politics of 1964 to 1980 for the next couple of decades than the politics of 1980 to 2016, which is hard for people of my age, because we, we all grew up and lived in a kind of politics of one kind, and now we have to get adjusted to a very different, much more volatile, fluid, unpredictable politics. It worked out okay in that case, I would argue. Civil rights revolution was a good thing, environmentalism was a good thing, feminism was a good thing. On the other hand, Reaganism was, I think, mostly a good thing, so you know, we, got, we ended up okay. Will it this time? That we don't really know. I mean, that is the question, and I'll just close with this thought. I mean, we, we, we hope the institutions are strong. The institutions and norms of American politics have been strong. I mean, it's, thank God they are, you know. We deserve no credit for this, our ancestors do. They've been built up over a couple of centuries. You know, it's pretty hard for one irresponsible president or one irresponsible political party, or maybe even two irresponsible political parties, to really damage American institutions in a deep way. If you elect Viktor Orban in Hungary, and you've only been a democracy for 20 years or so, and Orban is a pretty ruthless guy who's, you know, tapping into populist sentiments, and going after various liberal institutions, he can control half the media in Hungary in five years. He can get people fired from universities. He can, you know, really reshape in businesses and civil and society institutions. That's much, much, much harder to do, obviously, in the United States. And people at Stanford don't think they're supposed to respond, you know, to the follow Trump's lead. And people in businesses don't think they have to follow Trump's lead. And we have federalism, which is very healthy, because it means there are many more centers of power. And we have 
a big free private sector, which is good, and we have civil society and so forth. So on the one hand, I'm encouraged by the strength of our institutions, but we are running a test we really haven't run before in the sense of having a demagogue as president who really is willing to do things and say things as president that previous presidents haven't been willing to do that really stress, I think, the institutions in a way that it's been a long time since they were stressed. Um, you know, they were stressed in the 60s and early 70s, but the people in office mostly tried to damp down the stress. I mean, Nixon we think of as this crook and all that, but he had Democrats in his cabinet. He had, he, uh, you know, founded the EPA. He tried to actually, and that's why he was successful in 72 in his reelection, he tried to, he ended the Vietnam War, he tried to actually, in a way, bring the country together. Maybe it was based on some political agenda, but it, it actually, he didn't just try to divide the country. He didn't govern like George Wallace, even if he was happy to have the support of George Wallace voters. Uh, we're in a very different situation today, and that for me is really the big, the big question in a sense. And so finally, I think for conservatism and liberalism, the question is, you know, can conservatism rise to the challenge? Uh, conservatism likes to talk about American exceptionalism, but is that as sturdy a thing to rely on as it once was? Our politics look a lot more European than they did five years ago. And just saying American exceptionalism or believing, well, we're America, we couldn't go down this path. It turns out to be, I think, maybe wrong if you just look at the last three or four years on the Republican and conservative side. Liberals have a slightly different problem. They believe in progress, they're progressives, they believe in history. It's a nice belief, uh, and it's some, mostly true, I think, I guess. It seems like it's worked out that way in the last uh, couple of centuries. What is the quotation of Martin Luther King that everyone likes? The arc of uh, history bends towards justice, I think. But not always, right? And so I, I say there's too much complacency on both sides. Liberals are too confident, confident that history will, 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 will save us. Uh, conservatives are too confident that America will save us. And what we do need, I do think, is a pretty thoroughly rethought and revitalized conservatism and liberalism. And maybe it won't be a conservatism or liberalism anymore. Maybe it'll just be people thinking through how to have a vigorous and successful democratic capitalist economy and liberal, uh, and, uh, uh, liberal democratic society. Uh, and maybe the old conservatism and the old liberalism won't really even be, in a way, recognizable. But it is a new moment with new challenges. I'm optimistic that we'll meet them, but I think it'd be foolish to be complacent uh, about th that we will. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for a wonderful meandering walk through 60 years of our history. I find it surreal to be here as a lifetime liberal asking a responsible conservative a question. But I do have a question, and that is, do you think that anybody beyond Romney in the current Senate will develop some form of backbone where for at least between now and November they could do some controls on what the uh, oxymoron in charge President Trump was grueling for the next six or eight months. And one P.S. has he given you a nickname? Yeah. I think he's, no, I, I think he said I was fool, d dummy maybe or something like that was during the campaign, but not a, not a, not a distinctive nickname. Uh, I'll be brief in answering these questions because I went a little longer than I expected to in the, in the talk. As you say, meandering through history and not always in a cheerful way. No, I'm not optimistic about the next few months. I mean, I think the pressures will get greater, not less. I've always thought people underestimated this. Once you got into an election year, once people are, are even if they're not in primaries, if they're meeting with their, they're going to the Republican, what's the Republican convention going to look like? What's the reception going to be for any senator who does what Romney does? What, is Romney going to go to the Republican convention? I would be surprised. I know Mitt Romney pretty well, and I, mean, I don't think he personally will be intimidated from going, but he may just decide, what am I going to do? Go and get booed? What's the point, you know? Will anyone say anything like Mitt Romney from the stage of the Republican convention for, for those four days? Uh, how many candidates running for office will sound anything like Mitt Romney? So I'm pessimistic, not just about the Senate, but in general about the Republican Party, and I think the pressure on conservative magazines, columnists, activists, uh, talk radio, all these people, even the ones who should know better, 
to be part of the team sort of depends who the Democratic nominee is. The pressure will be much greater, or the excuse will be much greater, or the rationalization will be much greater if Sanders is the nominee, obviously, to stay on the team. But still, the pressure will be pretty great. So I'm pretty worried about the next, actually, I mean, think about it this way. We've had an awful lot of polarization, an awful lot of bad behavior, uh, an awful lot of uh, uh, things that we want to wish not to have. And now we're entering the election campaign, which is when people really do get worked up. And it's only just on uh, your point about Trump. What about Trump? What is he going to do as president of the United States over the next six to eight months? He's shown a pretty increasing willingness to use the instrumentalities of government for his own personal political benefit. That's what Ukraine was. Is that going to diminish? over the next six to eight months? Are we confident that we're not going to have you know, money flowing? I mean, there's always a little bit of this in politics, right? Nixon did this a lot. You know, hey, you know, swing state, we've got a wonderful federal grant here for a new you know, something in uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania. Well, fine, that's kind of routine. But how much more of that kind of stuff could there be? To say nothing of Russian interference, disinformation. So I'm, I think the next, this year is a worrisome year for American democracy. Yeah. Hey, Mr. Crystal, um, I'm really thrilled for, to have you here. I've been a big supporter, a big fan of yours, and was uh, uh, really cheering you on when you were trying to get uh, other Republicans to, to enter races over the past few years. Um, I, I should also say I, I just switched my registration from Republican to Democrat, so my, my wife is totally thrilled, and I'm mourning. I'm very sad. Um, I, quite, my question is uh, the colder personality of Donald Trump. Uh, He's got all these people around, around him who seem to be somewhat intelligent, saying one thing one day and another thing the next. And, and you know, Mick, he, the only guy he, that, that voted for impeachment was Mitt Romney, and he acted like it was the most horrible thing, that he was totally fearful. And I, I couldn't figure out what so, what, what so bad was going to happen to this guy. People are so intimidated by him. Let's, let's go with the hypothetical. He loses, let's say, in November. He's going to be wounded. Uh, don't things change a lot in that case? So that's a very good question. So uh, a, I, I, I too will go vote in Virginia on March third, and uh, request. We don't even have party registration. You just request a ballot from either party. But I guess for the first time uh, ever, I'll request a Democratic presidential ballot. And I think I actually do think we have a little project. But I might not vote for who most of you want, you know. And I, maybe this isn't really a Sanders-friendly crowd that's come to see me. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it weren't. But the, uh, I actually do think it would be healthy for the country if a lot of um, independents and Republicans, to, you know, within the bounds of the laws of the different states, do try to participate since the Republican primaries have been just shut off, basically, and literally canceled in some cases. And unfortunately, we just never were able to get a credible candidate because there never was any real support for uh, a challenger. Uh, to, to help the Democratic Party move in a more responsible direction would be a good, be a good thing. So I'm with, you, I'm with you on that. The power of rationalization turns out to be very strong. And people start off saying they don't like him, but you know, they can live with him. And then they decide, well, you know what? I kind of like some of the things he's doing. And then he gets attacked by the left. And then it's like, you know, he's better than the, look at the ones who are attacking him. They're even worse. And people get all in for Trump, have gotten all in much more than I expected. And for reasons I don't fully understand, I think some of it is practical and fear, political fear, and some of it is economic interest, and some of it is cultural you know, uh, issues, and some of it is really just psychology. It turns out it's surprisingly hard to hold the following view, which is a totally rational view, which is I don't like the guy, kind of a jerk, I don't like some of the things he's doing, but he's a little bit better than the alternative, so I'm going to support him. That is a totally... I'm leaving even names out of it. That's a totally rational view to have about politics. It's a totally rational view to have about life, right? We all do this all the time in every institution we're part of. I'll support this guy for chairman of my department. I don't think he's great, but it's a little bit better than the alternative. And in most of life, you don't then convince yourself a year or two later that, you know what, he is great. You think, you know what, he's not too great, but he's probably still a little better than the choice I had. It turns out somehow in politics, especially in a kind of democratic, little d, emotional, psychological politics, it's hard to sustain that kind of, I don't know, what would you call it, kind of cautious, guarded uh, support. There's a real temptation to sort of want to believe in your person. And you see that so much with the Trump support and the way in which individuals who were very reluctant and cautious and qualified supporters have become all-in supporters. Huge question, what if Trump loses? I don't know. I mean, I would like, I would have said two years ago, yeah, I think they'll 
people will snap out of it, sort of. There'll be a reaction to it. There'll be some Trump loyalists. But, you know, Goldwater lost in 64, and Nixon got the nomination in 68. Nixon wasn't perfect, but he was not a Goldwater type, you know, and so forth. McGovern lost in 72, and Carter got the nomination in 76. If, if an incumbent president loses, maybe that will have a similar thing. I'm not so certain now. There's a huge infrastructure under Trump, ranging from Fox to other parts of the media. Politicians have invested a lot. It's a little hard for them to just pivot suddenly. So here's the thought experiment. In 2022, Let's assume Trump loses by five points, but he's still active, he's still tweeting, the kids are still running around, There's, you know, they're on Fox, they've got some new network or something. Will it be better in a Republican primary, in most Republican primaries, to be endorsed by Trump or to be critical of Trump? I fear that the answer is going to be endorsed by Trump. I'm not so confident that everything changes overnight. And if it doesn't, then you do have a sort of Trump-inflected, maybe not Trump-dominated, and maybe it wouldn't be the same as when he's president, but a Trump-inflected Republican Party going forward. And one could ask the same question about the Democrats. What if, Demo what if a moderate Democrat gets the nomination and loses to Trump? I do think at that point, the Sanders people say, with some justice, I suppose, geez, you know, that was great. We, got, we, uh, we nominated the more electable person and we lost to this horrible president. They go totally, I think, in a left sort of direction. If Sanders loses, it's a little more complicated. If Sanders wins or if a moderate wins, it's more complicated. But um, you can imagine on both sides, the forces of moderation are weaker, unfortunately, rather than stronger, I think. Can you speak to a question in your original title? Was a responsible conservatism ever possible? Yeah, I would say yes. <laughs> and I would say, you know, I served in two conservative administrations and we made some mistakes, but I think we were pretty responsible. And George W. Bush made maybe more serious mistakes, maybe, but it was also ultimately, I think, responsible, tried to get a good immigration bill through, which I do think that was a moment the conservative uprising against Bush in, on, on immigration, against Bush and McCain in 06, 07, then again in 2013 when there was a bipartisan bill, turned out to be a real harbinger. At the time, I just thought it was kind of, there were people who weren't happy with Bush because of the war, and I don't know, they had these, their immigration was getting whipped up by talk radio. And I didn't take it, I was, I was unfortunate that the bills failed, but I didn't take it that seriously as kind of a, you know, I thought, okay, it'll get passed two years later or four years later. But that turned out to be a real moment of, where the party rebelled. But to Bush's credit, he did try to do what I would say is more or less the right thing on immigration. And, and you know, we went to a mosque 10 days after, I mean, think about that, around 9-11, and really emphasized that this is not a religious war and all this. And we, some of us thought he was actually going too far, not too far, but it was like a little, so, it was so conspicuous almost. But I think it was the right thing to do in retrospect to, to try to, it was gonna be a tough few years in foreign policy, but let's not have a, you know, cultural, uh, uh, let's make it, not make it any more of a culture war or a religious war than it has to be. Um, uh, but again, one, that's, that's quite different from the status quo uh, of, of the Republican Party. I have um, issue-oriented questions on two issues. So um, do you, why do you think that conservatives no longer talk about the budget deficit and the national debt? And do you think the debt is a threat to our country? And do you think the Bush, I mean, the Trump tax cuts were, you know, the prudent thing to do. And then my other issue is um, climate change. You know, why don't the Republicans, uh, you know, kind of believe in climate change and what's the path forward on that, you know, as a, as a nation? Yeah, I mean, they should be serious about climate change, and I think they will have real trouble getting any getting young voters until they're serious about climate. But again, people like me said that in 2013, 14, 15, and a million people said that, and younger Republican politicians said that, and John McCain said that, and. And then, of course, Trump, who couldn't care less about it, gets nominated and wins. So, like, I don't know. I mean, I can say, really, you're better off being serious about climate change, but who's, who's winning? And, and not just in, in, in the presidency, but in the Senate. Now, I, I would argue longer term, it's still a huge problem. But it's just winning, arguing against a winning president and against a sort of winning party that's complicated because they lost in the House and they lost a lot of governorships and stuff, but a party that thinks it's kind of winning. Arguing that they're on a foolish path is harder, obviously, than if the party loses. So that's, that's where you don't know how much things would change if Trump loses in 2020. Uh, it would make a big difference if Republican senators also lost and so forth. I, do, I don't rule out that things could change pretty. A lot of what makes Trump strong is that he's a winner. McCain lost. Romney lost. 
I can say it's on blue in the face that no Republican would have won in 2008 after the crisis. In 2012, it's against an incumbent president who's a very successful, uh, good politician with an economic recovery, and he won a narrow race. It's not like a disgrace for Romney, but it doesn't matter. Trump says, I'm a winner, they're losers. So being a loser might change things. On the debt and deficit, I mean, two things. Trump doesn't care about it, and Democrats don't care that much about it, but also have no interest in like being the party of you know, austerity, so they're not going to talk a lot about it. Also, to be fair, just objectively, people like me said, I don't know, eight years ago, hey, we can't just have all these trillion dollar deficits forever, and virtually zero percent interest rates. And a lot of respectable economists, I believe some of them here at Stanford, said the same thing. And here we are eight years later with very low interest rates and trillion dollar deficits, and we're not paying much of a price for it. Turns out everyone wants to have American you know, treasury notes, and we're chugging along with a decent economic recovery. I still think reality is going to hit and all that. But it, it probably is the case that until we're mugged by reality, you know, you just kind of, you sound like you're just warning about things that, that haven't happened. You know? Hey, Dr. Crystal. Uh, my name is Cyrus Beschloss. I'm a first year master's student here. Um, I'm wondering, I think my question is actually best articulated with a, an analogy, but if the Trump presidency is a, a broken ankle, let's say, it seems like there's some scar tissue that's built up in the way of media, in the way of different institutions, uh, whether that be young conservatives on college campuses and just uh, across the board. How much do you think that that scar tissue is a problem and how much do you think that, that actually dissipates if Trump were to lose? I mean, it's the right question. We sort of addressed it a little bit. I, I don't know. I mean, I've on the whole been sort of heartened I don't know, it seems to me when I go to college campuses that they're not, well, there are a lot of young conservative-ish students. They don't really think of themselves quite as Republicans now because Republican means Trump, but, and they're liberal. Um, that's not really a liberal position even anymore on marriage or on climate or whatever. But they sort of believe in free markets. They sort of believe in a strong America, an American-led liberal world order. They sort of believe we shouldn't just, you know, kowtow to dictators and, and, and ignore dissidents and human rights activists around the world. So I would consider those people kind of, you know, Bush-McCain Republicans. Um, they may not quite think of themselves that way, and they may be voting Democratic this year. So how much they, the party comes back to them or they come back to the party, how much you end up with a third party, how much the, the, the Democrats turn out to be more receptive to some of that than they have seemed in recent years. I think that's a huge question. I really think the future of American politics after November 2020 obviously depends on who wins and who the nominee is for the Democrats, but it's very indeterminate. And so I, I think the answer is I don't know, and I don't rule out though that if Trump, if the economy continues to be good, if he gets some, I don't know, maybe fake but foreign policy victory, I don't know. Could people could talk themselves into, you know, what this thing is working okay? You know, the economy's fine. What if, I mean, what if suddenly if Putin decides to give Trump, even if it's kind of a fake victory in October of 2020? I don't think that's out of the question. He might have an interest in having Trump be president for four more years. What if other foreign actors do something like that? So um, I think it's very unclear what the scar tissue is, how strong it is, uh, what the after effects of, of the current moment are. We just haven't really gone through, I, don't, I can't think of that many good analogies that would give us guidance in a way about how this, how this plays out. Hi, Dr. Crystal. So my question is about Michael Bloomberg. And the reason I wanted to bring him up is because you are a constitutional originalist, and I was wondering whether or not his complete and total dismissive attitude toward the Fourth Amendment rights of black and brown New Yorkers disqualifies him for you. And the reason I'm asking that is because, I don't know, I'm sure you're aware, but the Aspen audio tape came out two days ago. So Michael Bloomberg is a racist has been trending over the last two days on Twitter because two years after stop and frisk as applied in New York City was declared unconstitutional, Bloomberg is on tape bragging that he could just Xerox the same MO of a young black man and just send it out to all the cops in New York City. I'm assuming you still hold to a lot of conservative values. How does that, how does that sit with you? Are you worried that he would kind of scale up that kind of government terror throughout no. the rest of the country? And you're saying no, I hear you saying no, but why not? How, 
Because I think at the end of the, look, Bloomberg was a strong layer of New York and did some things he shouldn't have done and had a certain dismissive attitude, sort of, certainly on that issue, to what the courts ultimately decided and pursued policies that he probably shouldn't have pursued. Uh, though, to be fair, there was a huge amount of concern about crime, and this, these, some of those policies seemed to coincide with a decline of crime, even if they didn't really cause it. Um, but Bloomberg is not, I don't believe, I, I believe Bloomberg would be better for the country than Trump. I don't, how, you, don't have to, you don't have to support Bloomberg in the Democratic primary, but Bloomberg is going to appoint, if you care about liberal judges who, who are open to the concerns of black and brown Americans and to voting rights issues and to civil rights issues, you should prefer Bloomberg's judges to Trump's judges. If you want a Justice Department that's going to have a civil rights division that pursues traditionally liberal policies, Bloomberg is much more likely to have an attorney general who's going to have an assistant attorney general who pursue those policies than Trump. So I have no problem with being against Bloomberg in the primary. I'm not sure I'd be for Bloom. Well, I'm not sure I'll vote for Bloomberg on, 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 on uh, March 3rd in Virginia. But I, I don't think it's a close call, honestly. For, for me, at least, it wouldn't be. But what Trump. evidence do you have that particular Fourth Amendment unreasonable search and seizure? Because the president himself is, does not order a lot of searches and seizures. Um, right? Excuse me? <laughs> Say that again? The president is not going to be running criminal justice. He's not personally going to be running the police forces in most cities in the US. And a Bloomberg is a, well, what is a Democrat. You could have all kinds of issues with him, and I think they're legitimate. I have a lot of issues with them, some of them different probably from the ones you have. But it'll be a Democratic administration. If you think Michael Bloomberg could take the Democratic Party and make it a party that's hostile to civil rights in that way, I think that's, I just don't think that's likely to happen, honestly. Do you think he would actually order his department? Just a quick. Okay. And then we'll wrap up. Okay. So we can talk more about that after this is over. Because <laughs> um, I actually lawyer a lot. And I think one critical, very quick point on that is that you have to look to the states because that's where most law enforcement happens, not at the federal level. But the judge issue is huge. But my question, to bring it back to your topic, um, you touched technology earlier on, and you touched it in a way about jobs and the workforce changing, but I'm more concerned on this level and like to get your thoughts. We have a phone now. All of our processing, all of our information, whether it's Fox, it's even beyond Fox now, it's like social media. And what's really scary is what's truth anymore? Yeah. Facebook has advocated saying, we're not gonna touch it anymore. So when I look at a mean, when I look at video, when I look at pictures, when I look at sound, is it real, is it fake? So as a voter today, how do I process all of this? How will voters in 2020, 2022, 2024, because it seems to be getting worse, not better. Let's take the next question and I can, and I'll hold, take, yeah, okay. Um, Hi, I'm a sociologist studying conservatives, and it strikes me that even the never Trumpers in the Republican Party don't have a lot of outlets in terms of the community. I'm, so I'm not speaking about conservatives or Republicans in office, but just everyday conservatives. If you go to conservative Republican events, it's very pro-Trump. Um, if you listen to Fox News, it's very pro-Trump. So I'm wondering, I don't have to explain to a political scientist how important political party identification is. These people are quite unlikely to switch to becoming Democrats on the whole, but kind of what strategies do you see around community or engagement with folks who aren't happy with Trump, but aren't necessarily going to switch over to liberal sides or causes or groups? Good. Okay. Um, I'll go in reverse order, yeah. No, I mean, I think that's absolutely, uh, well, I think what would have to, have to happen is enough swing voters, and there are some, not as many as there used to be, would have to vote Democratic in 2020, Trump would lose, and at that point things might break open. And at least in some states, I mean, Larry Hogan is the governor of Maryland, and Charlie Baker is the governor of Massachusetts, and even Ron DeSantis, who ran a ridiculous campaign as a kind of Trumpy person in Florida, has not governed in a particularly Trumpy way. So one can imagine a pretty, some movement and some opening, let's say, up in party circles, in uh, conservative circles, in conservative media circles, maybe not Fox itself, but maybe at least in the journal editorial page, would abandon its, in my view, very damaging, actually, rationalizations of Trump policies. 
So I, I think you could imagine a move back, but I also think maybe not. I mean, I was talking to a retired Republican senator uh, who, hasn't, who was anti-Trump, basically, uh, but isn't, hasn't been terribly outspoken. And I was being nice, but sort of saying, could you do a little more? Couldn't you comment on some of these things when you know, Trump does something? It would make a difference, I think, in your state, and you're, you're, he's a person of some stature. It was sort of like, oh, God, I, whenever I do that, he said, he literally says, I, I go to the country club, and all my friends just you know, beat me up. And these are up, this is not you know, a Trump rally. This is an upper middle class, pretty well off country club in a well off suburb of a well off city in middle America. And those people do not want to hear the criticism of Trump. That really could change if he loses, I think. I think at least there's an opening for debate. I'm not, as I said, hugely, I, don't, I think it's foolish to be complacent that it's all going to be great. But I think at least there's a chance for something like what you're discussing. And within churches, within evangelical groups, within you know, civic associations that have gone in that direction, I think. But the mobilization now is really kind of astonishing and, and, uh, and worrisome. And uh, so I, you know, I look, the technology issue is a huge issue. I didn't really touch on any of that. To leave aside AI and you know, all kinds of, uh, not just the disinformation side of it, but the actual disruption side of things. Beyond just job loss, though, into really changing the way you almost you know, we relate to each other and all that, I, I think those are huge issues. I mean, one of the worst things about Trump is that, again, I think as a society, as a polity, uh, these are important issues. We've, we could debate them and discuss them. They're very interesting debates about big tech, I would say, about how, it, you know, what about privacy? What about who should control the information? It just seems like if you came down from Mars and discovered that Google has 92% of search and Facebook has you know, a virtual monopoly on social media and, and, and so forth, and uh, that maybe you'd think this isn't the most reasonable way to organize. You know, these are kind of, shouldn't we have a little more diversity in our companies? But maybe that's wrong. Maybe the way these things work, it's just, it's just better. You're going to have huge companies, and the question is how to regulate them. And these are all reasonable things to debate. Uh, it's pretty hard to have a reasonable debate now. Everyone's, and I, I'm sure we're all guilty of this, the focus on Trump. I mean, there are people writing intelligent articles in law journals and public, in public policy journals about these things, but they kind of get ignored for now. And even intelligent debates get distorted by Trump. So the conservative critique, which is, a, there's a lot of sensible critiques that could be made of the big tech companies, uh, is sort of a stupid critique, really, about, you know, they're discriminating against conservatives or whatever. And the Left also, I think, has now gone down kind of a rabbit hole of, you know, wanting Facebook to try to control the content on everyone's individual, you know, page, and which is a little nuts, honestly. Uh, but having said that, I think there there are real problems and real challenges. And again, I really worry. I kind of think we can come to grips with it, but we're not ready for 2020. I'd say I've talked to people. We're running with little lights, so I'll close, but. I've talked to people, not just about the narrow election security issue, but what is it going to be like for the next six to eight months? And you can really write worrisome scenarios that are not science fiction, I mean, that are very much based on what people can do and have done already in terms of disinformation, misinformation, uh, disruption of things, fake, you know, pretending, you know, so at the, I'm making this up, but I mean, at the Republican convention, people will be paid, you know, Trump. Well, Trump, let's just someone out there will hire people to look as if they are left wing demonstrators and they will go and beat up some pleasant middle aged Trump delegates who are minding their own business. And the whole media story will be intolerant, you know, Antifa left assaults, you know, law abiding Trump citizens, and it will be fake. Or it won't be fake. I mean, will we know? It's not so easy to discover these days. I mean, there's always been some of that in politics, and there was always disinformation, but I agree that the degree of just that alone, let us, leaving aside the much bigger issues of, of disinformation, is worrisome. And I've experienced this personally as editor of the Weekly Standard. We tried not to, didn't I think, you know, propagate disinformation, but we do, we do these cruises, I'll close with this, and uh, uh, you know, to make a little money to reduce that deficit. And uh, you know, on these cruises, it's, it goes somewhere nice, and you have panels, and you have dinner with the people. So these are weekly standard readers. I don't know how many of you have read the weekly standard, but it's, you know, our readership was older, upscale, just what you'd expect, you know, doctors, lawyers, businessmen. Uh, 
uh, well-informed people, nice people, pillars of the community, responsible people, actually, and cared enough to subscribe to a magazine, which was, you know, cultural stuff, arts and letters, history. It wasn't just, you know, a week, every week, you know, what the Democrats are doing wrong or anything like that. In fact, we got in trouble by having too much stuff about what the Republicans are doing wrong. But, um, and I remember in the last couple, it was really noticeable, after about 2016, 2015, 2016, You'd have dinner with people, and they were very nice people, and you discuss your kids and your grandchildren and jobs and the cities and what's going on in Dallas or Phoenix or wherever they live. And then someone would say, what about all these three million, the three million illegal voters uh, that voted in the last election? So, well, actually, they really weren't three million, and you know, oh, yes, there were. I read about it, or I saw it on Fox, or someone sent me an article uh, by email from some news source. Actually, this has been looked into pretty carefully, and here's what happens. There are people who are registered in more than one place. My kids are still on the books in Virginia, even if they live in New York, but they don't vote in two places, so they really aren't illegal voters. There are some overlap in registration, blah, 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 and people just wouldn't believe it. I mean, and you know, these are people who presumably liked me. I mean, they liked the Weekly Standard. They were on the cruise to be with us, but they had really internalized the misinformation to a degree that it wasn't like, gee, I, okay, thank you you know, Bill, for, for telling me that, I see I just got some bum, you know, bum information there. It wouldn't really change your views. You don't have to become a liberal if you don't think there are three million, you know, illegal voters. But the degree to which people wanted to believe what was in their echo chamber uh, was, I thought, kind of a new phenomenon. Now, it's happened in his history many, many times, but in a modern American politics, less so, I would say. And I think that is a real problem. And it's because how do you fix that? I mean, it's, there's no obvious way to correct that. Yeah. Would you please join me in thanking the Thank you.